Vector also had contact with the UTIC organization. I decided to quit my job at Vector. This object is called Ren Le Chateau. It's a landmass that belonged to Lost Jerusalem. Swordsmanship. Uzuki. Tell us, both her reaction time and Hilbert's strength are three times Cosmos's combat range. That is... Omega. They're calling it Omega. Rest Novae. Cosmos will never awaken again. Xion, the only one who knows where we are headed is Cosmos. The only one who can open Cosmos's heart is you. So please. Wait. Nephilim. Cosmos's heart. Chapter 47 Calm Before the Storm Somewhere in the city, we see Nephilim and Chaos talking on a rooftop. Apparently, the reason Nephilim is so cryptic is because she can't tell Shion the whole truth, as the truth would be too hard on her right now. Just like she said in Xenosaga 1, Shion is not ready to accept everything right now. Chaos says, Learning the truth doesn't always lead to happiness. They might even be better off if they live without it. But sometimes, the truth seeks you out. Despite this, I Chaos believes that Xion has to learn the truth. Nephilim and Chaos both seem to be concerned about Xion's mental and physical health for some reason. Maybe it has something to do with those headaches she's been getting. Hmm. Then we see that it seems Chaos still has some questions about his own existence. He believes that he may just exist because he's meant to, and everything is just flowing in time to an, an inevitable point. But Nephilim tells him, that she doesn't believe in predestination, and she believes that a single human thought can change everything. An idea which Chaos used to not only believe in, but he was the one who taught this idea to humankind. Chaos still has doubts about how he should use his power and why he's allowed to exist. Remember, his power is what will inevitably cause the lower domain to be destroyed, but he doesn't want this. Even though he has, he has his doubts that the future can be changed, it seems that he still wants to believe it, which is why the, he's, he's been sticking around with Xion and the rest. Back with Kanan and Julie, we see how they are looking into Ross Mantel. Kanan changes the topic and tells Julie that in order to get inside the hypersphere surrounding Rene Le Chateau, they'll need a power as strong as the PG Cannon on Omega. But as Julie says, that's not going to happen. However, apparently, there is something else that can break through it. Cosmos Tertiary Weapon System. Julie tells him, Julie tells him that that's also not possible, and she brings into question his situational an an analysis capability, because Cosmos is already slated for disposal. But Kanan tells her that she is the one unable to analyze the situation, as he pretty much tells her, "Yeah, we're just gonna have to break the law." Although Cosmos has already been thrown out, they can still recover her before she's scrapped and rescue her. The game then cuts to Margulis speaking to <laughs> a floating light. This is apparently how Wilhelm presents himself as Heinlein to Ormus, along with his laughably deep voice. I said to abandon it. Did you not hear my words? <laughs> it sounds like a woman trying to sound like a man. Heinlein tells Margulis to abandon Omega, but Margulis insists that they recover it and even begs Heinlein to order its recovery. But nope. Heinlein has spoken. Margulis asks him to explain himself, not as a confrontation, but because he's becoming confused with his recent orders, including abandoning René Le Chateau. Heinlein tells him that he's already taken measures against the Zohar project, maybe he means Telos, and that Omega is already in it with its rightful owners, meaning that, no, it did not originally belong to Ormus. Margulis, who has always been told the opposite, now begins to get more confrontational, Bon Heinlein tells him. Fifteen years ago on Milsha, I know your place, Margulis. Do then Heinlein dismisses him, telling him that he just needs to obey him without question as everything is God's will. Yeah, this is Wilhelm playing on Margulis' faith. Back in Fifth Jerusalem, 
Yeah, this game jumps back and forth between groups a lot in the early parts of the game. Alan is worried as to how he's going to break the news about Cosmos to Xion. Julie then walks up behind him and asks Alan if he can help her get in touch with Xion uh, so she can discuss with her Cosmos' rescue. Speaking of, we see Xion talking to Doctus who analyzed the footage, but after re researching it, it seems she found no information on Telos or Rothman Tell. The, work, the records weren't erased either, they just never existed. Something Xi'an finds odd, as he's working for the military, they wouldn't just let an unknown person with no work history work for them. After some talk, they come to the conclusion that Ormus has something to do with Talos' development. No way. Doxus apparently also found some information on Xi'an's father. After asking her if she's sure she wants to know the truth, Doctus and Miyuki inform Xi'an that her father was a Galaxy Federation inspector who was tasked with observing Utic, which makes it more likely that he probably betrayed the Federation at some point. We already knew everything about her father, thanks to my other videos, but this is when Xi'an first hears of all this. But that doesn't mean he conspired with Professor Mizrahi and summoned the Gnosis. Th this sort of thing happens all the time, you know? An incompetent government bureaucrat fails to stop a crisis and it turns into a catastrophe. What? What kind of example is that? It, uh, I mean... Xi'an also finally understands why Jin has always been so concerned about Xi'an getting involved with all this stuff. It was to protect her from this information about her father. Xi'an then gets a call from Alan, but before she can take it, she is hit with yet another headache and faints. Alan, who joins the call, sees her on the floor and he hurries over to the hotel to check on her. When Xi'an wakes up, She's in the hotel bed and Alan is sitting next to her. The sum of Xi'an fainting to her being overworked. Then Alan tells Xi'an that Julie wants to meet with her in the Durando on the following day, meaning that she will have to miss the day that they set up. But Alan understands. However, Xi'an, knowing that he's probably disappointed, asks Alan to go out for a bit. Guess if they can't have their day tomorrow, they'll just have it now. We see Xi'an and Alan having a nice date outside in a part of the city that still has nature as it's protected, but overlooks the city center. There isn't much of note here, but it's nice to see that Alan finally has his moment with Xion. <sighs> However, Xion had to ruin it by bringing up Kevin. Poor Alan. Then we return to Kanan, who is visited by Doctus. Doctus never liked Kanan much. She never even calls him by his real name and just refers to him as the reality. Xion, we're getting out of here. Realian, you with me. My name's Kanan. You should remember that by now. Sorry, didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I don't waste brain power on trivial things. But this discovery of the Kanan program has only fed into her suspicion, so she interrogates him, simply asking him who he is. Kanan is unsure of what she means, but Doctus doesn't believe him. It seems that Wilhelm left the existence of program Kanan a secret even from him. So he's just existing while the program r runs in the background. I'm not sure if this was always the case or if this was a modification done when it changed him from Lactus to Kanan. Doctus believes him and so she gives him s some of the data they obtained on program Kanan. Before leaving, Doctus tells him that the program may interfere with his behavior. So even if he really doesn't know about the program, if he interferes with them, in any way, she won't hesitate to eliminate him. Chapter 48, Rescuing Cosmos. The next day, Xion wakes up, apparently she sleeps with her shoes on, and gets ready to go to the Durando. Once there, Xion meets up with Rubido, Momo, Ziggy, and Jin. Considering how much time has actually been in game since we see all of them together, it's actually a pretty heartwarming scene. They all make their way to the Durandal Bridge where Julie and Alan fill her in with the, all the information about scrapping Cosmos. They also fill her in about the Elsa and the Hypersphere. Apparently, the Hypersphere is now shrinking and will in time shrink to the Planck scale and leave this dimension entirely. So I guess it's just going back to the same space time as the rest of Earth. Apparently, the Hypersphere is connected to the imaginary number domain and the only way to open a hole through it, even with Cosmos' tertiary weapon system, is at its weak point called the Klein Point. 
uh, gnosis actually also have a klein point and before the creation of the hilbert effect hitting this very small point with enough energy was the only way to destroy a gnosis this wasn't a very efficient practice though anyways julie tells everyone of her plan to steal cosmos and Shion, of course accepts not only for the obvious obvious reason of rescuing cosmos but because she can't allow herself to abandon the elsa right after Shion has yet another headache and faints chief Shion. Shion is taken to a bed under the Durandal, where Alan and Jin take turns checking in on her. Apparently, not even the medical staff of the Durandal know why she collapsed, but again, they assume it's just exhaustion or something. Jin goes into the room and to talk to Shion. It's clear that Jin still worries a lot about Shion, but it seems like not only does he does Shion take his advice more lightly now, but Jin seems to trust her to make her own decisions now. Jin then leaves her room, leaving behind an herbal remedy. Later in the day, we see Xion, who has recovered, exiting the Durandal along with Julie. Julie expresses how she envies Xion as she has stayed true to her beliefs after the Gnosis terrorism, even if it means making hard decisions. It seems that, she's reg that Julie is regretting being involved with the development of Omega, as it's a weapon with absolute power that seems like it's being developed for no clear objective. Much like Xion is driven by her beliefs, Julie is driven by her desire to cleanse the name Miserahi to society. After Julie tells her that she believes Cosmos is more than a weapon, she heads out as Junior and Chaos meet with Xion. After going over their plan in Xion's hotel room, the whole gang make their way into the Zohar project facility where Miyuki helps them sneak in. While in an elevator, Xion admits that she's only asking Miyuki for help because she had nobody else. There wasn't anyone else I could ask. What about Doctus? You could have asked Gientia. They're busy with something else. Ha! I knew it! You're only using me because there's no one else. <laughs> hey! Stop laughing! Your job is to make sure we don't get caught. Please don't screw this up, Miyuki. <laughs> hey! I said stop laughing! Anyways, the group make their way into the facility where they keep encountering some dead ends, which get blamed on Miyuki. Um, well, the elevator isn't responding. Miyuki, you screwed up again, didn't you? What? No, wait, it's okay. I thought this might happen, so I prepared another route. What's going on, Miyuki? The elevator went past our floor. What? Uh, hmm, I wonder why. You messed up again, didn't you? Poor Miyuki. It seems she has taken Alan's place as the bumbling fool of the story, and pretty much everyone sees her as useless. It's actually been a little hard seeing how everyone treats her. Finally, Jin says that he doesn't believe it's Miyuki's fault, as it seems somebody's guiding them somewhere. The elevator goes past the floor they're supposed to go to, and takes them to an underground hangar where Omega is stored. While looking at Omega, Xion again gets lightheaded, but she doesn't faint. She just falls over on Ziggy, and she manages to get herself up. Barely. While trying to stabilize herself, Xion notices someone looking at them. It's Abel. When Xion addresses him, he simply says, Sad being. This way. Then he walks into another room. This is actually when Alan fills them in about how Abel is actually Omega's pilot, and that he lives in the facility. This makes Rubido think this could be a trap, but they follow him anyways. Also, Miyuki takes after Xenosaga wants Shion. Um, I don't understand any of what you just said. What's going on? They follow the path into what looks like a giant trash pile, and there, discarded like a piece of trash, they find Cosmos. It seems, however, that she hasn't taken any damage so they can just reboot her. Using some interface device, Xion and Miyuki notice a strange task running inside Cosmos, but they don't know what it is. It just seems like feedback. Being unable to analyze it where they are, Xion decides to worry about it later and instructs Miyuki to send the, to send the data to Doctor so she can analyze it. Alan then starts up Cosmos, and after a few seconds, Cosmos wakes up. Xion takes some time to try to think of the right words to say, and then she settles on the words that she told Kevin to say when, when Cosmos first woke up. Why don't you just say, Good morning, Cosmos. Morning, Cosmos. How do you feel? Good morning, Cosmos. How are you? 
And good morning to you, Xi'an. Cosmos informs Xi'an that for the most part she's running normal with no problems, speechless with a sense of happiness and sorrow as she feels like she abandoned Cosmos to this fate. Xi'an can only walk towards Cosmos to hug her. She apologizes to Cosmos, but Cosmos has no idea why she's apologizing. Is there something wrong, Xi'an? No, it's nothing. I'm just happy. That's all. The group immediately begin to head out, but on the way, Xi'an gets lightheaded again. And even though she's fine. What? It's nothing. I'm fine. She faints again. I told you she says that a lot. As she sleeps, Xi'an begins talking to Udo again, although she's still not aware that this is who she's talking to. Anytime these events happen, I'll just let them play out because it's the only time we ever get to hear what kind of things Udo asks, and the questions are so simple and straightforward that if I were to tell you what they say, I would just be reciting their lines, to be honest. Xi'an. Is that you calling me again? Who are you? What do you seek? I don't seek anything. I want to know, to know you, to know your world. You want to know me? I want to know you as well. Tell me, who are you? I am the will of the universe. You identify me as Udu. You're Udu? What do you desire from the world? So yes, Xion now knows she's talking to Udu. Information which seems to be so irrelevant and trivial that she decides to share it with nobody. She then wakes up and of course everyone is worried about her. But of course, she's fine. They then continue heading out and they make the, and they make it into the arena where Cosmos fought Omega. There they're confronted by Gnosis and defeated. The military keeping Gnosis around is something that both Jen and Rubido seem to find dishonorable. Anyways, they make it out of the, uh, out of the Zohar project facility and quickly beg, get back to the Durandal to rescue the Elsa. As they head out, we see that Ross Mantel has taken notice of them but he's standing outside of the space elevator on the roof. So, he's not an ordinary human. The Blue Testament then appears next to him, and they begin to discuss how, of course, this is all going according to plan. Chapter 49, Rene Le Chateau. The Durandal makes it to Gedalia space, where the hypersphere is. There, they are attacked by Gnosis, which the ESS saved Dina, hold back to give Cosmos and Xion time to open the hole in hypersphere. Cosmos stands on the Dina and activates her tertiary weapon systems. She shoots a beam into the hypersphere and nothing. It just causes a little ripple. As everyone, save Xion, begins to doubt Cosmos, Cosmos decides to setting weapon deployment to maximum output. You should have led with that, Cosmos. Of course, the tertiary weapon system somehow gets destroyed and falls off of her because there's no way they were gonna let you let be that OP in game. The group make their way into the opening they created, and after they enter, the opening closes behind them. Once inside the hypersphere, Momo announces that the air is breathable. Then they get a call from the Elsa's crew, who are ecstatic to see that they have finally arrived to save them. Well, Tony and Hammer are ecstatic. Matthews is a bit more pessimistic. The group make their way to the Elsa where Matthews informs them that they can't escape the hypersphere as for some reason the freaking logical drive isn't responding. The professor, by the way, did I mention that the professor is here? Yeah, um, he's been around since Xenosega 1, but he's always been a side character for side missions. Now he's been bumped up to secondary character status. His real name is Hakshin White. I mentioned him during my character montage in part 4 of this video series. Anyways, as I was saying, the professor tells them that something in René Le Chateau must be affecting the ship, and so the group go back out with their ESs to investigate. After winding through some tunnels, they make it to a giant cave. 
There, Junior notices some writing in either Hebrew or ancient Aramaic. He then reads some of it, but gets lost quickly. Then Momo recites it. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. She can't read it per se, but she recognizes the writing as it was stored into Y data. Suddenly, a laser shoots out at them, but misses them. It's the Blue Testament Virgil on top of his ES, ES Naphtali. Sheehan remembers them from when they weren't in the Song of Nephilim, and Virgil tells her that he remembers her too. I remember that you let me die. <gasps> Sheehan is shocked to see Virgil behind the Testament mask, but Virgil tells her that he's not here to get sentimental. He just has business with their ES crafts. As he says this, he attacks them. Sheehan tries to stop him by apologizing, but Virgil isn't having any of it. Then the ESs begin to glow along with the writing on the wall. It seems that being in Renella Chateau helps the vessels of Anima awaken. Virgil tries to explain this to them, but it seems they're, e they're even confused at the mention of vessels of Anima. They really have no idea what they're writing in. Then a battle with Virgil in his ES begins. After the battle, Virgil is technically defeated, but he is a testament. His demeanor makes it very clear that he's not even faced. Sheehan asks, asks him how he's here if he died, but Virgil gives her more cryptic mumbo jumbo. Then from above, we hear a familiar voice. Oh, please. Enough babbling nonsense, partner. Oh, no. It's just the newest testament, the White Testament. Huh. I thought his voice sounded familiar. Guess not. Hey look, even Junior thinks it sounds familiar. Junior believes that this White Testament is his brother, Albedo. That voice! Uh, Albedo? Hey, wait a minute! Albedo! It's you, isn't it? Did you forget about me? Despite Junior's question, Albedo... I mean, uh, the White Testament doesn't respond. He uses his ES, which is totally not a remodeled version of Albedo's ES Simeon, to remove the now awakened vessel of Anima from ES Naphtali. Remember how I said Wilhelm needed the vessels of Anima to awaken? Welp, one down, eleven to go. As soon as the White Testament retrieves the vessel of Anima, he, he and Virgil leave the scene without saying a word, leaving Junior calling out to him. Unfortunately, they can't chase after them as suddenly the words on the wall along with their ESs begin to glow again. This time they become unresponsive and start losing power. I don't know guys, I, I truly don't. I don't understand this. I don't know why this happens, but it does. So with that, they're forced to get out of their ESs and find a way out on foot. The group managed to make their way out of the cave and to the surface to a grassy area with ruins. Xi'an quickly recognizes it as the place she saw Nephilim in way back when she was in the underworld Linde. Speaking of, Nephilim shows up behind Xi'an and just walks off, prompting Xi'an to follow her. After yet another wave of pain for Xi'an, the group follows Xi'an to where Nephilim went. Here they see the place they saw Cosmos crucified in when they dove into her subconscious. They've arrived at Mary's grave. There they notice some coffins carved into the ground, 12 to be exact, but they're all empty. Momo notices that one of the coffins has the name Asher on it, Rubido's ES. Another has the name Dina, Xi'an's ES. These coffins are where the vessels of Anima were hidden. Xi'an and Cosmos then move toward the centerpiece of the room, a casket with a stone plate covering it. Behind it, the cross Cosmos was on in her subconscious domain. Xi'an notices this similarity and asks Cosmos if he knows this location, but Cosmos states that her memories contain no data of this location. As they continue forward, something jumps at them and attacks Xi'an, although Cosmos manages to block it. It's Telos. Telos tells them that she's here for the 13th key, that being the crystal Xi'an holds, the other 12 other vessels of Anima. And everyone notices how similar to Cosmos she looks. Chaos seems to sense something about her. This presence. But wait, she can't be. Hmm, I wonder what caught his attention. It seems that Tello's main objective here, aside from her 13th key, is specifically to destroy Cosmos. 
I wonder why. The group engages in battle with Telos, and it seems she's downed as her body is lost in a cloud of smoke. Cosmos informs Xion that Telos' output is 4.75 times higher than her own, putting them at a disadvantage, a statement which, conf which confuses Xion, as they all believe that she's done. But as Cosmos tells them to leave while she sits behind to distract Telos, we see that Telos is standing amongst the flames completely unharmed. Cosmos, knowing full well this isn't a fight she's going to win, charges at Telos to buy everybody else time. It's not just that Cosmos' attacks have no effect on Telos, it's that she pretty much evades and blocks every single one of them. So for the most part, Cosmos doesn't even get a hit on her. After Telos throws Cosmos around like a ragdoll, for a while. Rathmantel shows up behind Talos, telling them that they've already analyzed Cosmos' attack pattern. That's what that task they found running inside Cosmos when they retrieved her was doing. Rothmantel tells him that Telos is destined to destroy Cosmos in this place. Then he reveals himself to be the Red Testament. Now we know who all the Testaments are. Well, except for the white one. We still totally don't know who he is. So the developer of Telos is a Testament. Look at that, more things under the control of Wilhelm. But why would Wilhelm want to destroy Cosmos if she holds Mary's will? Remember how I told you that Cosmos was a temporary repository for Mary's consciousness and that he needs Mary's body for the real vessel of Mary's consciousness? Well, keep that in mind because the plot thickens. I need fear! We see as Cosmos' beatdown continues, she's not even putting up a mild challenge to Talos. It's a, it's a pretty depressing thing to witness. After noticing that Xion and nobody else has heeded her advice and left, Cosmos tells Xion that she will only last 140 seconds in her current capacity, but Xion refuses to leave her behind. After Telos throws Cosmos aside, she runs straight for Xion but is blocked by an unyielding Cosmos. Cosmos begins to shoot her with a Gatling gun and finally someone decides, hey, we should help her. And that someone is my boy Rubido. I mean, of course he isn't doing anything, but it's a thought that counts. Despite everything, Telos is just not going down. Finally, Telos tells Cosmos, Return to dust so that I may truly awaken. Wonder what she means by that. As she says this, she charges a phase transfer cannon. Knowing what's coming, Cosmos separates herself from the group and holds out her hand to try to stop it as Xi'an's crystal glows. When Telos fires the cannon, we see that Cosmos actually manages to stop. Oh, wait, never mind. This attack completely overwhelms Cosmos. and she collapses with a missing arm. Xion begs Telos to stop, but she steps on Cosmos' chest and smashes her, prompting Xion to yell in despair. Suddenly, her pendant glows as Cosmos' eyes go blue and also begin to glow. Behind them, a bright light comes from Mary's grave. Everything is glowing. As all the lights continue to, to grow and envelop everyone around them, we see from the Durandal that the hypersphere completely collapses in on itself as a bright light grows around, uh, around Ranella Chateau. The gravity around Ranella Chateau begins to grow, forcing the Durandal to retreat. Whatever is happening also seems to ha be having an effect on Wilhelm's compass of chaos and order. It has begun. Once again, in the same place. It has begun. <laughs> 